tomorrow breathes greedily. And this old clock, whose white face is hung in the room, cold air, for all its life, thinkings of the silence between think and talk. Uh, the second one name is Free Fall. I wrote this poem for a woman. Uh, she has killed in protest 2009 in Iran. And uh, her name was Nida. She ran on, only a few steps in front of me, before she fell on the road of freedom. Freedom is beautiful, even when you are in free fall toward death, even when you grow cold, laying in your own blood. Bullets, dear bullets, Please go back to your shell castings and we too will go back to our homes. The next one. We are the embodiment of constant embraces going inside of each other's bodies. Just say that you know there is no way left. It doesn't matter that the sun won't rise. We have said farewell to everything. Say that you won't be disappointed. Because we have smelled many white flowers in the darkness. Who knows what will happen tomorrow? Stop yourself. Hear the sound of your heart. We are each other, the countless face of, because we love one another. Who knows what has happened to yesterday? The edges of all knife are sharp. It's just enough to turn your head. No, just go on to the arms which are open for you. Who knows where the truth is standing? You can only touch it there. You can only touch it there. Where a hand in the darkness is seeking your hands. The next one is, uh, the name is Destiny of the Grass. The bird does not deceive itself. The plant does not take pride in its fruits. The pain does not think of nerve. The destiny of the grass does not matter for the deer. The salt does not know its notes. The fear is not a distance between the night and the tree. Red is not red for itself. The mountain does not need to pick altitude. The world feeds off this instinct, bris, which doesn't have any name. The next one is, the name is White Sorrow. Like an, an iceberg, your head has surfaced on the ocean. No one will understand your whiteness. Nonetheless, hold up your white flag for peace. 
All our lives we have fought without any memory of the victory. And fear has shadowed our faces. We have to stop it. No, nobody will understand us. Because they won't believe that the star that we have on our chest is a real star. This is a short poem. <clears throat> I have a forest in my fist. I have a forest in my head. Folk series. Oh, sorry. I have a forest in my fist. I have a forest in my head. Folk of birds returns to the nest inside me, as well as words that return to my mouth with the rain drops. Uh, the next uh, poem name is Narrative. With, with the intention of with the intention of walking in another world. With the intention of walking in another world, this one I left behind. With the intention of walking in itself, the world took leave of me. Without, we were going on separate phases. But, these were the separate ways which told of us. The paths continued in us and we didn't think anymore. Uh, the next one, the name is Word. Word is a fish. It breathes through its mouth. It sleeps. It sparkles. It jumps out of water, diving back in. Ford is a river. It has no home. It washes. It freshens. It floods. It reads itself new. Ford is a scree. Inside of it has a mountain peak. It turns around as it gets polished. It rests. Word is a name, your pleasant name. It carries the word inside of it, but it summarizes in some simple alphabet letters. The next one, the name is With the Mouth of Silence. I was back from the war. My mouth had the odor of gunpowder. There was not much left of the body. A leg, an eye, and a heart that beat once a day. Who named you? the homeland, and made one dead bloody soldier out of my white words. Me, who have called you true, the truth of the plant. Me, who looked at you with the eyes of a poet. And now that I am staring at my homeland eyes, I know the destination could be not to reach. The next one, the name is Self-Portrait. She spoke with two voices, 
with two lips. She thought with two forehead. She looked with two pupa in each eye. She was half in two with every step, half backward, half forward. She crawled. Two persons, she was half between herself, half between in her halves, two peoples with no direction, no borders. One of her mouths singing life, one of her mouths whispering deaths, deaths. Desolated harbor. We are the residents of the desolated harbor. With upside down hulk and old sailors. sailors. We are the residents of the desolated harbor. With upside down hulk and old sailors with houses made of sand and palm trees made of sand, men and women made of sand. We don't generate anything. An eternal pain has dried our blue sea and the wind turns the seagull made of sand into dust. We are the residents of the desolated harbor. Waiting is too old a small piece of a stone in the hollows of eyes. And sometimes from our pity, we give a pat on the back of a scare proof that every day turns her turns page of his book made of sand, turn it and finds nothing. Nothing. And the last poem, the name is going. Objects are rambling at home. Chairs walk room to room, corridor to corridor. Carpet is folding itself, leans over the table, Spreads again, stand up. Paste is set to the roof. It prefers the height. Curtain leans over the wall. It stands by window. How tiresome. It starts to walk. Lays down on the floor. It stands up, it dances with music. The door opens itself, closes itself, bangs itself, halfway abandoned itself, gazes at its door knob, holding its hand, walking from the bedroom to the kitchen. The kitchen to the porch stands. Desire a landscape. Pictures from are kissing each other. Books talk together. Flowers come out of the dust. They sit in the sofa. They share some memories. Under the shower, two windows make love. Power hung, I walk on the ceiling in the same time as I sit. I embrace the life. My name is to go. Thank you. Thank you for your poems. <laughs>
And uh, I really like them. You know, I, I, I have read them in, I mean, uh, page and, and they, they are really meaningful and delicate. Thank you, Shabnam. Thank, Thank you, you for your support. <laughs> okay, so now sure. I'm going to our third poet. Now, Shabnam, if you could please, oh, yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, Vahid Dabar. Uh, Wahid was born in 1981, I believe, in uh, Fars province of Iran. Uh, he is an Iranian poet and PhD student in Persian studies at the University of St. Andrews. Dawar's debut collection, Sefre Safar, or The Book of Journey, was highly commended by Shamlu Poetry Prize 2019. He translated his second poetry book, Ahde Nassim or Nassim tes Nassim's Testament during his uh, Master of Research, I think, creative at the uh, University of Liverpool. And uh, um, he, he, he will uh, actually uh, tell us about uh, his first and second poem, The Bright Salt, I believe, is the first one. And uh, uh, the, fa the first chapter of Nassim Testaments is the second one. Please welcome Wahid Dava. Sorry for the mute clapping, Wahid. You can um, start now. Uh, thank you, Sana. It's a true honor to be with you, your other guests, and those who are seeing and hearing us tonight. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, the, the, two poems that I'm reading tonight be dirges in memory of Rasul, Shiva, Anita, Armin, and Artin, the Iranian family who drowned on channel crossing two days ago. Uh, the two poems that I'm going to read tonight are both self-translated. Uh, the first one is a modern pastoral, which is the first in a sequel of 11 pastorals in my debut poem collection, Sefre Safar, or the Book of Journey. And the second one is the first chapter of Ahd Nassim, Nassim's Testament, an elegiac epic I wrote in memoriam of a friend of mine who passed away 13 years ago in Iran. Nassim's Testament is also a tribute to my refuge, Liverpool. Pastoral one. Imagine date palms could grow on this cold isle. Imagine that fairies, sorry. Imagine date palms could grow on this cold isle. Imagine the fairies now on their way to the office, still roamed in woods with lanterns and long white dresses. Imagine in this belly of darkness, cars were cottages where humor could be brought all fresh from shepherds. Imagine your mother could cross the border with a suitcase and a sewing machine and come to your house to stay forever. Imagine the border guards knew what it is to trek across mountains and plains. Imagine a rainy night and your hat stand snowed under with scarves and wet umbrellas. Imagine the Smith Down Cemetery held your blood relatives. Imagine in dawn's sleep the clink of coffee maker and cups sounded from the kitchen. And you were not dreaming. So the next one is um, The Bright Salt, the first chapter of Nassim's Testament. And it starts with uh, uh, Connor uh, from Iranian Students News Agency about my friend's death. HR, a poet, and one of Nasimi's friends also said, I will say very clearly what the cause of Ali Reza Nasimi's death was. Nasimi, who spent his nights with the homeless to write a little of their reality was sad because of the coldness we had caused him. 
he had gone to take refuge in nature's arms. He went to Kala to visit his poet friend, Vahid Dava. It was on his way to Dava's house that he slipped on the snow, fainted and froze. The bride salt. We said, we don't, we don't want to die. They said, then if you don't, Allah's earth is patient enough. Less than two nights after, we sold our house and bought shoes and caps thick enough to kill the cold and biting winds of Dunkirk and Bruges. It was raining. Warm aqua regia had already dissolved the civilization we had built on the bank of Kalat River. The people smuggler was picking pears from every herd to place in the shipping container two by two. There were two who were mateless, Nassim and I, so we remained by ourselves and aqua regia flooded the earth. We gnashed our teeth, imagined ourselves flying over London on a spring cloud, and London would be a village like Kalat from there. What day was that? Asim said to me, fortify your heart for my mother's kingdom is at hand. Awan was Nassim's mother, Nassim was Nassim's mother. Nassim was born on the threshold of Sayyid Allah Adin Hussein's shrine. His mother was not one body with his father, yet Nassim was one with his mother and was buried in her. Wahid, who has seen him in his life and afterlife, says, neither was his blood blue, nor was his voice like Sayyid Allah Adin Hussein's bells. The day of Nassim's funeral, a nightingale sang in the city's cemetery, Lorca blew in a bull's horn, and the National Library's card index overflowed with his name. He was the bright salt prism who cast the rainbow on the unseen world. And of his funeral, they say, it came to pass that Rambrandt took his firstborn to the mountaintop held the blade to his throat. But God sent a ram and the ram bleated, pree thee, pree thee, meaning, O oh God's friend, leave him alone. And on the day of his birth, the shrine's forty lamps were sweetened with lemon and quince. And on the day of his death, the sparrows lined up like loom strings on the cross and wailed. And their school of soul appeared at the edge of Syria Island, put their lips on the snow spring. We were born in fleeing, knowing that only brains flee on aeroplanes. But we were ghosts who fled at midnight on a shipping container. My father sold our house and I was the first border north of my tribe to discover the north of the earth. Fleeing was a birth. The rivers were born without their permission and they crossed the borders, but nobody counts their pebbles before they pass. Northern cranes fly southward, their tags uninspected by border guards. I, who am both Nassim and Vahid, was a mateless tag, frenetic, crossing the wet Patagon, and the warden of the plain made me declare my faith. It was raining. It was raining aqua regia, and it was like Israfil was blowing into a vuvuzela. I had to imitate Nassim, for he sowed the way to Golgotha too. So we didn't stay and were healed of Shiraz. Of life's many vanities, one was poetry, and Nassim was also relieved of vanity. 
but why did I not say he fell young? Thank you very much. Thank you, Vahid. I literally absorb every word of your, I mean, poem. It, it was really intense. I really like it. Thank you. Thanks for such a good reading and such a good poem. Thank you. So uh, we will discuss your poetry afterward. And uh, now I'll go to our fourth and the last poem of uh, actually poet of tonight, Leila Farjami. Leila is a poet, psychotherapist and literary translator in uh, and she, she is the author of several poetry books in Persian. Her work has been widely published in literary journals in Iran and abroad and translated into English, French, Swedish, German, Arabic, and Turkish. Um, as an immigrant who has lived mainly in the US since an early age, Leila's poem reflects her diaspora experiences and existential uh, struggles and the reclamation of her voice. In addition to the history of her formative years in Iran as a child, uh, witnessing war and daily disruption of norms by an oppressive regime. Um, please welcome Leila Fajami. And uh, Leila, mic is yours. Okay, well, um, warm hello from Los Angeles. I had to change my background because construction started to go on, you know, with a lot of hammering and noises and I had to leave the room. So anyway, um, it explains the new background. Um, it's such a pleasure and honor to join every and each one of these wonderful poets, plus anyone and everyone watching us today. Um, and thank you for the introduction and your efforts and, and invitation to join. So the first poem I'll be reading for you today um, is just one of those poems that comes by itself. And I think uh, Mr. Obis referred to it as something on the go. And this was actually originally written in English, not in Persian. So I, you know, I, I write in both languages. Um, so I shall just start reading it. A mountain is a mountain, a bull, bull, a camellia, camellia. I am I. The stars in the sky are the pebbles of earth, the Holy Ghost, a little girl riding her bicycle joyfully to an ice cream truck in afternoons, a crawling turtle, a sluggish planet inching for the edge of infinity, your hands are the limbs of the oldest cypress and the moon is aging like your face. Deep craters of grief, yet silver veins of a sacred light that beams through the glow-bound pupils, all white, all silent fall, all readiness to enter into a soul's mold. If I was not born on the day of an eclipsing sun and darkening willows, the mountain would call me forth in its own echoing rise. The bull would charge through my blood-drenched muleta. The camellia would triumph over this speck of dust universe and the fire beneath our feet would be a witch's blazing breath that turns death into a palmful of luminous cosmic ash. So that was the first one. Um, the second, I was thinking, it's going to be probably about war. Um, because as you, I think you may have noted in my 
biography. I experienced war, you know, the war between Iran and Iraq for about six years. So I wasn't there for the last two years of the war. Um, but my formative years are extremely affected by it. And as a trauma therapist, I have not only a personal experience of it, but a professional experience of it as well. So this poem is called War is Blue. And this was actually self-translated from Persian. War is bluer than the sky, the bluest of all spinning celestial bodies. It levitates angelically amongst its lucid corpses in the rush of its chilling winds, its lifeless limbs wedged between planets and human bones, bullets and blood laid out piously at dawn. The bluest is war in, fix in fixated color. It never turns black like my heart nor purple like your skin, the perpetual blue, the sea of natural monsters, the lunar gravity that summons the afloat refugees of capsized rafts, the underwater moans, the last quiet breaths that will not reach the world. When the bodies are caught like lifeless fish and are spread out, over the smooth and glistening shores. From far away, they appear to be a pack of drowsy children blanketed by warm and playful sand. So I guess, Sanajan, do I have time for a couple more? Of course you have. These yeah. are shorter poems. I appreciate it. All right. So um, I know that you know that I lived in, in America since, you know, my younger days. And so for the past four years, I'm sorry. I said most of your life. Most of my life. Exactly. And um, so for the last four years, uh, we've lived under the um, misogynistic and very much patriarchal regime of Donald Trump, um, who systematically demeaned women and minorities, and that's known to the world, to anyone who wants to know the truth. And so this is a poem that just sort of came about a couple of years ago um, from, from profound agony and sort of a sense, a sense of helplessness and re-traumatization um, as the, the very same experiences um, were invoked, you know, from my years in Iran, right? And I just want to explain to non-speaking, uh, well, non-Farsi speaking, um, Iranian audience that uh, means to hang, okay? Because that word comes in the poem at some point. So avichtan means to hang from something. This poem is called um, The Encyclopedia of Fathers. In my motherland, fathers have authored the encyclopedia of torture. A the first letter of the word avichtan, to hang, as in hanging from nerve threads, frigid bones of jasmines, brittle pillars of space. The book of uncanny semiology, bullet holes and blood. Behind these doors, there are women who recite its words by memory, Women who at sundown cross through burned wheat fields and the ordinary tragedies of bread and salt. They stand side by side to gaze at the moon and its silver crows, 
side by side in weight of a calamitous end as they resemble the black and white pictures of a mass execution. So that's my ode to patriarchy. And last one. So nothing to say um, distinctively about this last poem. It's just about an early day, early morning, when I experienced dawn, actually, I'm a late riser, but this was an exception, exceptional day. And uh, this one was originally written in, in Persian and self-translated. It's a poem for my um, last volume of poetry in Persian, which is called The Psychiatric Hospital, Room 29. Red pupils, blazing spirit, seeping through door slits, another morning. Today's drenched skin creased through the night, its unrelenting hours, fingers inside ash. Now, the white magnolia flowers form a luminous day of births greeting the gods of gardens, sons, and heroes. Yet they do not reveal the wondrous heart pulsing about their secret ambrosia, devotees to an unseen paradise, natural and present. With their invisible bulbs at night, such silent funeral procession a black curtain unfolds over their lids. Eternity, an impervious mask, sheathing the naked voice by its never expiring time. We roll and roll through wheat fields and stars, dirt and wind, like the sun setting over the apple tree. We inhale the last flare darkening inside our cores. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Leila. Thank you for uh, um, such a great idea, a strong idea and uh, strong performance as well. Thank you. So we will come back to you. Um, uh, guys, we have discussion. You can ask anything you want in the chat box here. Uh, actually, it's a chat column, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, uh, you can share anything you want in this chat box here. And uh, I will start with my, my own questions um, and then we can have your questions as well, if there is any actually. <laughs> so my first question is um, actually, because you are all kind of migrant, I wanted to ask how did you find your poetry in terms of uh, migration, being dislocated, being far from uh, the homeland? And um, I want you to tell us about the positive and negative impact of it um actually on your poetry and your life if you like uh, i believe that the best person to talk about that in terms of being translated is ali reza abiz and if you want to start with him uh, i would like to ask about his book at, as well his forthcoming book with bloomsbury if he like to uh, i mean if he likes to Talk about it. Uh, first, unmute Ali Reza, if it's possible. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, so, sorry, could you please re repeat your question? Maybe, yeah. If, if that's okay. No worries at all. First, if you like, you can tell us more about your forthcoming book. 
Uh -huh. And um, second, how did you find your poetry in terms of migration, being dislocated, <laughs> being far from the homeland? Uh, the negative and positive aspect of it, impact of it on your poetry and uh, your life, if you like? Okay, th thank you very much. So there are two questions. The first one about my, my forthcoming book, which I hope is planned to be published in December this, this year. So uh, it's a kind of, it's the first, I can say the first uh, academic study on censorship on Iranian literature, as far as I know, there has been different uh, shorter studies, but not in a kind of monograph. And I tried to study censorship in Iranian literature during the past 40 years. Uh, but I also give a history of censorship, a short history of censorship in Iran since the start of press and publication in 19th century, which uh, uh, works as a kind of background information. And then I do a theoretical study of censorship theories in order to find the theory which works for my study and which works for my generation, which grew up during the past 40 years, first as children who started reading literature, then as writers and poets who tried to write and publish literature. And I also have a short period of experience as a publisher, which I was working as a publisher. So I also included that as well. So how in order to do this, I needed a definition which would serve my purpose. And what I found was, firstly, I tried to redefine censorship in light of the experience of being censored, which negates any kind of universal definition of censorship, saying that whoever defines censorship in a global uh, worldview, they need to reconsider based on the experience of censorship, because it is not a unique experience anywhere. Censorship exists everywhere. So what is the difference? The difference is in the scope of experience and in the intensity of experience and in the way we experience it. The other finding was that most of us consider censorship to be deleting and omitting and banning. Well, what I found very surprisingly was that this is not the aim of censorship. This is actually the tool of censorship. The main aim of censorship is to dominate one discourse, one narrative. And in order to dominate that discourse and that narrative, they have to subdue the alternative narratives, the alternative discourses. So this banning and uh, this banning uh, part is actually a subsequent uh, tool in order to make that dominant narrative dominant. The other finding I would like to share is that uh, as far as there is the coercive direct censorship from the government or from the source of authority, it also reveals the failure of censorship because it shows that censorship regime has not been successful enough, so they have to use force. In this sense, we can say that censorship has been more successful in democracies where there is no apparent censorship. So for example, because it has been so deeply ingrained in the social constructs, in the market force, in the laws, that you don't need to use force, that the government doesn't need any external pressure because we, in, in Western democracies, people already know to self-censor themselves. So there is no need for external pressure. So in that sense, we can say that 
if we have direct censorship, say in Iran, it also means that there is a still things which are relevant and worthy of telling, and they need to be censored by force. While in Western democracies, probably there is nothing left to say. So there is nothing to censor. This is just a kind of observation and a vague observation. But if anyone is really interested, um, please buy the book and read it because I worked uh, about seven or eight years on that book. So for the second question, uh, I believe that uh, language is the uh, home of poetry. And as far as we live in a, in, in a language, then we cannot say that we migrated or we lived in exile because we, we carry our language with ourselves. So in, in one sense, uh, no one is an immigrant in poetry as far as they try to write in the same language. In another sense, we can say that everyone can be an immigrant, even if, if they don't leave their homeland. In, this, in that sense, that you uh, learn from other cultures. So there is a kind of internal immigration as well. But uh, talking of physical displacement or dislocation, uh, to my, in my own poetry, I can feel the, I can feel, uh, the trace of uh, my life in UK. Uh, in the imagery that I use now. To be honest, even in we the can form. feel that too. Sorry? To be honest, we can feel that too in your yeah. poetry, obviously. Exactly, yeah. The imagery, the, the change of imagery, even maybe the change of uh, at, uh, attitude to our poetry, what type of things we consider significant or worthy of writing poetry about, uh, this has probably changed both by my living here and, of course, by my studies of English and world literature as well. Thank you, Ali Reza. Uh, uh, there is a, a question here from uh, Mehdi Sadaqat Payam. Uh, is there any free version of the book available for people inside Iran? Actually, the book is forthcoming uh, in this December, I believe. But uh, will be there a free version of your book? No, I don't. I don't. I don't think so because it's, it's up to the, copyright. Yeah, okay. it's up to the publisher. I don't. Uh, I, I'm, I'm confident that I don't have the right to offer free copies because it's just being published and the publisher has spent money on it. I know. So, can it can it be published in Persian, for example, in, in Iran? Do you believe? I it's guess, at all. yeah, even for that, I would need to. Uh, I know to the permission. Trans, from yeah, the permission from the publisher. Yeah. Uh, it might happen in future, hopefully. Hopefully. Good, good. Good. So, um, actually, this um, question and answer, I believe, that leads us to, to another question, which I, I'm really willing to ask other. Um, um, participants and poets uh, that um, uh, if you ever encounter with censorship, um, I believe that censorship can easily deny you as a poet and uh, it can narrow down your opportunities, obviously. Uh, um, have you ever encountered, uh, I mean, uh, maybe Shabnam is the best person to to uh, answer this question, because she had to leave Iran. Um, uh, yeah, sure, Sana. Um, yeah, as you know, uh, I'm, um, I first leave Iran in, uh, since 2009 as an activist and journalist. And, but um, I want you- I have your, your uh, image as well, your video as well. Can you, can you turn on the camera? Yeah, I turn up, but I don't know what's the problem. <laughs> can you make it on and off? Yeah, I will try again. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, as I said, uh, since uh, I first live in Iran uh, since 2009, and uh, because of my activity as a journalist, and um, um, I can say about your question, writing in far from the homeland and uh, uh, far from mother tongue, uh, I can call it uh, writing with uh, flaming fingers. It's the name of one of uh, my poetry because I'm really feeling that. Um, all of the poem poet is here uh, from Iran and uh, where Iran where is uh, ongoing censorship, um, some kind of war, uh, suppression of uh, opposition, and my entire life uh, has been affected by Iran's political situation. Well, and, censorship in particular. Yeah. Um, the censorship, have you encountered it? Have you ever been censored? Sure, your, your yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because I, uh, two of my uh, book uh, has published in Iran and both of them had some of my uh, uh, poems had um, uh, censored. And um, if I want to uh, explain that, I can say my entire life has been affected by Iranian political situation and uh, I grew up witnessing many terrible things happen to my country and people and I have always uh, emotionally affected by them but um, uh, you know and since 2009 uh, none of my books can be published in Iran and behind that, uh, as an activist and journalist, I am not uh, able to back to return uh, to my country. And um, but uh, the positive part of that is poetry um, helped me uh, survive and stay strong, um, especially through migration. You know, and uh, if I can say the positive part of migration, uh, uh, I can say migration widened my uh, horizon and uh, influenced my poems. Uh, and uh, I find new landscape, you know, and, uh, and I can say my poems grew up in migration. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And what about you, Leila? If, if you have anything okay. to say. In terms of censorship, specifically? Uh, censorship and the impact of being my... Actually, uh, um, you, you talked before about the uh, impact of being migrant and uh, actually mm, dislocated from Iran to America. Um, if, if you like, you can sure, talk more. I can, I can speak to that briefly, right. okay. So I came to U.S. many, many years ago um, when I was about 13 and a half, 14. And um, I've been mainly writing in Persian. So I've been, you know, um, trying to get my work published in Iran. Um, some of the books were flat out rejected by the Ministry of Reform uh, because they literally wanted me to change all the poems and uh, just, you know, choose the benign, benign words that, that they recommended and just really bizarre. So um, with several of my books, I just gave up on publishing in Iran. As a matter of fact, just recently, I had a huge volume of this amazing and well-known poet whose work I translated from English to Persian. And um, again, I, the, the whole volume was rejected. So yes, uh, I mean, very uh, personal experience of censorship. And I just wanna say, um, not just as a poet, but the, the censorship is all encompassing in, a, in, in, a, in an autocratic, any auto, autocratic regime. So it's not just, um, censorship upon works of literary figures, yeah. 
but the entire populace. So that's also really important to consider. Um, and that's, I mean, so yes, I've been censored. <laughs> Very good, thank you. What about you, Wahid? How do you feel about being here as a poet and being ever censored in your homeland? Let me um, speak about uh, my life as a poet in the UK. Um, I came to the UK in um, 2013, and it was my it was not my choice to be sent to Liverpool. It was the city wherein uh, I had to wait for the outcome of my um, interview at the Home Office, and uh, because it took you know about 11 months, uh, I had already fallen in love with the city and its people and 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 the culture in the city. Just, just if I can, if I can add something in bracket, that's really brilliant and that's really brave that you talk about it such explicitly. I mean, in your poetry, in your book, and here, that's that's really, I mean, brave and appreciated. Thank you for that. Well, uh, you know, this is something. I mean, the accounts of uh, people's uh, asylum odysseys is something that uh, people have been silent about, uh, some of them may be out of shame. But uh, I had a chance to work as an interpreter in Liverpool for uh, you know, uh, asylum solicitors. And uh, that really gave me an opportunity to um, hear people's stories um, in addition to my own stories and uh, kind of interweave these stories in an, um, uh, you know, um, in, I mean, uh, I mean my, my, my poetry in particular in Nassim's Testament where I have these uh, two uh, main speakers, Nassim and Vahid, who are not completely, you know, uh, biographical characters is uh, ventriloquistic, I mean, as if sometimes these two characters in this poem act um, as puppets to, you know, um, be a means for other people to speak through. So I really um, appropriated some of the stories that I heard, and and I need to add that, you know, a code of practice in what I did. I mean, interpretation for people is that you need to speak in first person for the person you are interpreting for. So when I um, interpreted for these people and spoke about um, the reasons they left Iran for, uh, I always needed to say I, uh, I, I left Iran because of this or I left Iran because of that. And also um, interestingly, um, when I lived in Liverpool for a number of months, I realized that Liverpool was a city of poets, just like my uh, hometown Shiraz in Iran. And uh, I can't remember where uh, I read this, um, what uh, Adrian Henry, one of the well-known uh, Merzi poets, but what he says, he, he you know, says to someone, come with me to any pub in Liverpool and then we will have a drink. And when the bottle is empty, we throw it in any direction you wish and it will glance off a poet's head. So it means that uh, the city is full of poets and also uh, that the flower that stood uh, for my hometown Shiraz was Narcissus. And um, the flower that in my eyes uh, represented Liverpool was Daffodil two very similar flowers. And the first time I saw daffodil, I told myself here is a blood relative and uh, I have some blood relatives in this uh, city. And you know, ever since um, after I left Liverpool, now I live in Scotland. But uh, when I look at Shiraz, you know, when I remember my hometown, Liverpool stands between my eyes and my hometown or my birthplace, like a daffodil pattern the screen and it is inevitable 
to see Liverpool in between. And uh, I, I, you know... What um, a, what, sorry, what a great depiction. As you are a, a drawer and painter as well, that's really brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I just uh, wanted to say that it's not a matter of geographic uh, distance. I mean, even if I had left Liverpool for somewhere geographically closer to Shiraz, say Istanbul, anywhere outside Iran, um, it couldn't or it wouldn't change anything because it's not a matter of geographic distance, but it is a matter of intertextuality. Um, uh, and, and, and that's, uh, uh, well, uh, all I can say at this moment about how uh, uh, my migration or, or uh, my coming here um, as a refugee informed my poetry. And of course, uh, censorship is uh, something, I mean, uh, my poet friends, Ali Reza, uh, Leila and Shabnam, they um, uh, spoke very well about censorship in Iran and outside Iran. I just need to add to that, that um, one of the things um, beside what my friends said that um, that still is existent in my life as a poet is, you know, self-censoring. And, and I am very aware of that, that I am still censoring myself a lot because of, uh, you know, um, the 32 years that I lived in Iran and, and how uh, that milieu, how that society um, informed, uh, informed uh, my, my, informed my, uh, you know, personality, or, or uh, maybe I am a, a pathologic, really, um, agent of censorship in myself. Actually, the experience of that during these years, and Leila would be <laughs> the best person to talk about that, because she's working with such a, I mean, um, um, things, issues, and yeah, struggle so maybe Leila you can you can continue this discussion sure so I mean the experience of displacement is is you know is universal and deeply individual as well um, and it also depends on uh, you know its chronological kind of origin um, so it also depends on like not just the space that you're coming from, but at what age and also how, right? So, I mean, all of those are elements and, and what's awaiting you on the other side, you know? So my experience personally was, um, I was uprooted from a place um, where I had grown my roots in despite the war and, and the, the external chaos um, that was happening. But as I was transplanted here, at that tender age, um, there was an element of, of shock, you know, and um, I was not fluent in English, so I could not communicate my, I couldn't identify nor communicate my feelings. So I was imprisoned, if you will, in this um, involuntary isolation. And uh, for me, poetry happens to be a poor man's art or a poor woman's art. <laughs> so I come from a middle-class family. And at that time I couldn't, you know, anyway. Um, so I had a pen and paper, that's how I started. Um, and through that, and the reason I'm mentioning it, I don't want it to become about me because it is a general experience, but, um, the ways um, that it was, it was revealed to me how this process of, uh, you know, displacement and uh, dislocation had affected me um, was not only profound, but uh, really revelatory in ways that I hadn't expected. 
um, so Vahid was speaking to self-censorship. Yes, that was part yeah. of it. That's a cultural, you know, dimension. Yeah, that was my I'm still aware of it. Well. Yeah. I'm, yeah. And you, as a woman too. Talk. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there, there are certain words that are not acceptable by the Iranian culture for a woman to express or even incorporate into her poetry mm -hmm. and writing. So, I mean, all of those things and, and a general picture of it, yes, it involves trauma. And I worked with many immigrants and refugees through, through the years. And it could be that even if the environment to which um, you're now being, you know, um, newly born into, you know, if it's a better place. I mean, obviously America turned out to be um, till 2016, when the uh, <laughs> autocratic regime took over, turned out to be um, not, not a blissful place, but um, a very inviting and warm space for me, right? Uh, yet, that doesn't mean there is not nostalgia. That doesn't mean there is not yearning for something that's become lost in a sense. So, yeah. Very good, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for the explanation. And uh, now actually, as there is no question from the audience, I will ask, ask my own question. Uh, uh, mm, it is, um, uh -huh. tell us about, um, any of you, if you are interested, tell us about the um, possible differences between the concept that you, you deal with as a poet in, in Iran and the, the one that you find here um, in um, actually, Western literary texts. Um, I, I can have an example for you. For example, I feel that here the poems are more uh, literature uh, is more kind of uh, self centric. But in our country, for example, we think about justice, injustice, and the things that are really are not in our hand actually. Uh, if it makes any sense for you, actually. Yeah, any of you, if, if you like, uh, Abis, if you like to start. Um, yeah, thank you very much. It's a very, very important question and very difficult to answer, to be honest, because, um, well, you need to, uh, first of all, I can speak about, uh, I can make a comparison between the poetry in Iran and the poetry mainly in UK because that's what I know a little bit about and uh, we cannot categorize and talk about the West because every country is different but the, my experience is that in Iran we still have a little bit not it has been uh, it is not as, as it used to be but still we have the expectation from a poet as a kind of social leader. So we, we, still, we still look at our poets as intellectuals in the in sense of uh, public intellectuals in the, for example, uh, French uh, uh, meaning of the 20th, 20th century French, like uh, an intellectual that Jean-Paul Sartre would, would advocate. So we, ha we still have that kind of expectation from poet to be socially engaged and to be socially active. And uh, that's, one, that's one difference. When in, in, in UK, many poets choose not to, not to be socially active, at least not to, not to talk about politics and they're not expected to. But in Iran, if you don't do that, there is something wrong with you. So the society and the uh, community of poets and community of writers ex expects naturally expects poets to take side. Well, partly it is because politics is living and thriving in Iran. So we are still talking about major issues like democracy, the rule of law, 
uh, freedom, these kind of ideas, which seem it, they have been achieved in the West. So you don't need to talk about them. So you have the luxury of writing about yourself now, writing about your own feelings, writing about uh, uh, plants, writing about fishery, writing about uh, the beaches, writing about forests. These things look a little bit luxurious to us because we have to write about political struggles, social struggles that we still feel. The other point is that uh, talking of uh, contemporary subjects, things that are written today, I can say that the range of ideas that poets write about in Iran is really, in one way, it is huge. Because they have all this, and at the same time, they have those kind of rebellion of the new generation, the, the, the generational gap, uh, the religion, the sex, uh, eroticism in different categories. Uh, all this is, is, is huge. And you see, you see, probably you might see a, um, you might see part of it in the UK as well. But first, the language is more contained, uh, and it's more uh, focused on form uh, rather than on content. So I can I can feel this kind of. Uh, um, chasm between these two cultures. Uh, but of course, it's all a personal observation. And people who read different corpus might completely have a different observation. Definitely. What about you guys? Um, back with Leila and Chapman. Uh, OK. Um, well, uh, you know, like uh, Mr. Abiz was, Adiza was referring to it. Um, it's really difficult to categorize distinctively uh, what what is different. What is the difference between Iranian poetry and like the Western poetry, or just Iranian poetry and, and poetry of even its neighbors, right? Um, because there is so much, you know, so many elements that goes into that mix. But I can draw a, sort of a rather clear distinction between the current popular American poetry, because I've lived here for so long, and Iranian poetry. So Americans now tend to be um, really focused on narrative poetry. So it's, it's a poetry that reads like story, which I'm not fond of. So I'm really fond of um, like economy of language and like, you know, being impactful with as, you know, um, list words that you can be as a poet or writer and so their view is really different um currently okay there are american poets that i really love and admire so i don't want to make a general state you know overarching statement about that either but with iranian poetry i noticed that it's affected much more by its european counterparts right so Many, many countries in Europe, I realize that, but there is a poetic sensibility and appreciation of imagery and brevity, which I noticed much more in Iranian poetry. Okay, so that's all I can say. Uh, what about you, Rahit? Oh, the, the only thing, uh, let me thank uh, Ali Reza and Leila first. The only thing that I would like to add is that Ali Reza spoke about a chasm and I believe that, you know, because we are probably um, the biggest nation in exile and uh, because of how scattered we are all around the world, I think that chasm in a way is bridged um, you know, through poets like um, Ali Reza, uh, Leila, Shabnam, and, um, you know, um, poets of um, the older generation of uh, Iranian refugees and migrants, such as Ismail Khoi, Majid Nafisi, 
and, and others. You know, uh, through these poets, I believe that Persian poetry in these decades has grown aerial roots in every possible and impossible direction. And uh, I believe that through these poets, um, uh, the eyes of Persian poetry have been opened to you know some some realms that uh, it used to be blind to before and and uh, I consider that as a benediction for Persian poetry. Um, so back to your question, um, even concept wise. Good, uh, Shabnam. Would you like to add something? Uh, yeah, sure. And uh, thanks uh, the, uh, to Leila and uh, Alvis and Bahid. Uh, I can add just uh, that generally, um, as a poet in Iran, um, in order to write a political or an uh, erotic poem, uh, one must take an uh, indirect approach. Uh, lyrically, as it, it's important, I think, because um, um, they should use metaphors. This way, this, those who uh, censor cannot understand um, what I say, and they might not block it. And today, many poets, uh, I think, in Iran uh, use this method, and it has become a style of writing in, uh, in the country, I think. And uh, yeah, that's it. I, I just add it. Very good. Thank you. And um, actually, I have another question. Um, is, that, is that writing poem kind of um, uh, do you feel you have to write something or you do it just as a, a kind of um, 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 self contemplation kind of self concentrating thinking or, or you think it's kind of commitment to do that you feel that urge to do that um, if anyone wants to um, start to answer, Leila? Sure. Um, well, thank you for asking that question. You know, um, the fact of the matter is this world would have been the same without my poems, I feel. So I sincerely don't feel like there would be anything missed. Um, yet there is a, there's like an innate sense of wanting to generate and regenerate. So it's like a visceral drive for me that's indescribable. At the same time, in my grandiose days, I may feel maybe it's a form of contribution. <laughs> but um, I say that humorously because um, I, I feel that, you know, um, again, it's such a personal experience for everyone. So I can't pigeonhole it into a sense of responsibility or a complete, like a visceral drive for me, like, or it's, it's certainly a, a tool for self-contemplation. Um, and I don't think I could personally live without it because it's a, it's a very cathartic experience for me when I write. Um, but I don't think that my writing affects anyone else see on the grander scheme of things so that's realistic actually yeah um, that was a good answer what about you Vahid? Uh, well um let me say that um, i mean 
and that I have to write doesn't uh, necessarily mean that I am committed to writing poetry. Um, it rather means that I am committed to writing whatever form or whatever you know genre that I have been brooding on, and you know, you know, um, um, with regard to what I have been brooding on, uh, uh, you know, what 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 that um, demands from me. Um, provided that I find enough talent and metal in myself to do that. Uh, so um, in this case, I believe uh, we are faced with a kind of responsibility towards what we feel an urge to respond uh, to, to respond to in, in ourselves. For that, uh, we need to undergo self-contemplation. Uh, so, so these, uh, you know, this commitment and that self-contemplation in my eyes, they, they go um, hand in hand. Oh, very good. Uh, what about you, Ali Reza? Well, <clears throat> to be honest, uh, my relationship with writing poetry has changed over time. So when I was much younger, I, uh, I believed that there is an urge to write. And if I don't write it, I have betrayed myself. Or I might even think that writing poetry is a kind of uh, prophetic mission, which poetry reveals and I mean, being inspired. It seems and... that it is. <laughs> well, I mean, as a young person, I believed so. I mean, but... I'm younger than you. Of course, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> a few months younger. <laughs> Uh, but to be to be honest, over time, uh, my 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 approach changed dramatically. Still, still, I can say that I feel that I have this kind of deep relationship with poetry. Every day, I think about poetry, not not just writing, reading poetry, thinking about poetry. But I don't think, as Leila said, I don't think that if I don't write, the world is going to shatter and I have come very skeptical of the value of my poetry at least personally so very often I question myself that what's the use of writing is there any benefit in writing who is going to read them and even if someone is going to read them what's really what if you don't write what's gonna change so there is this skeptical view of the value of poetry yeah. As even you can see in this in the poem that I, I read uh, this evening, saying that maybe if I have been into politics, I would have been more useful. Yeah. So the, uh, yeah, if I, the usage of this writing poem. Yeah. Exactly. If I want to be absolutely honest with you, can I live without poetry? Yes, definitely I can. Uh, but will that mean that i am missing something yes a huge part of myself would be lost without poetry oh, so true. it is that kind of uh, problematic uh, relationship that i have maybe we can call it a kind of uh, put it in psychoanalytical term it's a kind of traumatic relationship uh, sadomasochist relationship that you are in you can't get away from it but it's not always uh, pleasant sometimes it's really traumatic very good thank you thanks for your explanation you. uh, Shabnam would you like to add something to this discussion I think uh, that's yeah, the so. that yeah sure yeah sure so I want to just add uh, something. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's very different. Uh, sometimes it's um, like connection to another world with thousands of image and images and uh, I'm just writing that, try to writing some of that. And sometimes it's um, totally different. Words um, uh, come slowly and sit in their place that's it without any edit without anything and sometimes i should edit my uh, poetry uh, more than once maybe and um, 
Yeah, uh, that's it. I, I think um, it's a, it's a, but you know, writing is a fantastic bridge for recovery. I think and their stability. I think it was um, unbelievable helpful for me, uh, especially during uh, truth migration. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Actually, it is. I think uh, Leila can uh, confirm that for us that mm -hmm. it's kind of um, healing uh, process or tools for for many people, isn't it? Yes, yeah. there is. I'm sorry, I didn't know if you wanted me to because you, no, no, you yeah. address me. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I don't want to cut anybody off. Um, no, sure. So. So yeah, I mean, there is such thing as journaling, as you know, in therapy, like, you know, and therapists give assignments and so on and so forth, because, it, you know, uh, you are awakening your unconscious, the collective unconscious and your personal unconscious mind. So you're, you're awakening um, a lot of and shedding light on a lot of dormant and dark corners um, of your soul. And absolutely, it's uh, like Shabnam said, it's... Um, it's very significant in, in terms of its, uh, you know, uh, recovery values. Uh, highly recommended. Very good. And uh, I think we are done with questions and there is nothing in chat box yet. So, so we can uh, maybe ask Jennifer to join us and if she... <laughs> If she has anything to say, because Jennifer is the uh, actually the manager of uh, Exile Writer Inc. If if you would like to join us, Jennifer, at the uh, for the actually end of the discussion, are you ready at all? Hello. Hello. Um. Well, right. <laughs> it's been such a rich evening. Um, I don't know where to start. I thought I knew so much about Iran and Iranian literature, having done a PhD in it, but I I'm still learning, I'm still learning, um, you know, about, I'd, I'd love to read, for example, Ali Reza's book about censorship. I have read sort of pamphlets about censorship before, and, um, in our forthcoming 20th anniversary book called Resistance, we include a little poem by Ghazi Rabi Havi, a rather satirical poem about a man who's sitting behind his desk, whose head can hardly be seen. Yeah. And, and the protagonist comes along with a story and in the end so much is censored that there's hardly anything left, it's not worth you know, publishing it, the, the writer feels his work has been destroyed. Um, I'm wondering whether in Los Angeles, where there's such a large exiled Iranian community, um, whether there's a kind of community of poets who, who share their work or, um, you know, I can think of now what's her name. Uh, well, I, I did spend three weeks in, in LA as part of my research and I just met so many. I, I met, must have met about 28 writers over the course of three weeks um, to interview them, you know, about nostalgia, about trauma, exile. Um, so I just wondered whether that whether the community of writers kind of gets together in any way. Is there anything like Exile Writers Inc. over there? Or? Okay, good question, Jennifer. Well, um, you know, I wasn't really participating in um, this, this specific meeting that I'm going to tell you about, but um, it was running for about 20 years, and I think, or, or maybe even more so, and they stopped meeting about a few years ago. Uh, it was a notable meeting of uh, meeting uh, for Iranian writers and poets. It was called Saturday Notebooks. 
So um, they would meet uh, one Saturday of the month. And, um, you know, the founders, I think, were Majid Nafisi and, yes, and Mansour Khaksar, you know, the late Mansour Khaksar and a few others. Um, but right now, I do not personally know um, a, any meeting that would resemble that now in Los Angeles. It seems like everybody's taken their work online <laughs> and just producing online and, yeah. And I, I don't know much about Northern California, but um, the majority of Iranian writers actually do reside in, in LA area and the suburbs around it. So, yeah. Good, thank you. We touched on um, gender, but you know, that's a huge area. I'm not sure what the time is now, but um, you know, gender and uh, hijab and you know the, the whole dynamics of it iran the west it, and, and then areas like you know writers in prison in iran uh, with dual nationality where the western um, nationality isn't recognized you know, uh, are those areas that the right the poets avoid? You know, the poets here tonight avoid. Do, do they feel endangered in in exile? I can think of several poets here who have uh, been endangered. Uh, poets and well, the satirical writer as well, Hadi Korsandi. Um, uh, a bomb was, he had special police protection here. Um, also Ziba Chavasi. So I know that some writers prefer to remain anonymous or use a different name online <laughs> when writing about certain areas that are sensitive especially if they still have family left in Iran. No, I'm, I mean, it's, there's just so much to talk about. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. No, thank you, Sana, for organizing the evening. And really fascinating. And thank you know, you, the four poets. Yeah, great poets really great poets and, and we had really good poems tonight and uh, I, I think we're running short on time and uh, it's time to just wrap everything up and uh, say goodbye to our friends and uh, 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 we have a few I mean uh, so no, uh, before time. before we go uh, can't we can't we hear uh, one of your own poems Actually, I mean, I'm not you, really you, ready. So. No, you, you forced us all to read, but <laughs> you, you can't just escape like that, you know? I, I know, but I'm not really ready, um, Ali Reza, to be honest with you. I really, uh, actually, i love to share my poem with you, but, uh, but I'm not really ready at the moment. And uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe it's better to leave it for uh, a better time maybe in future <laughs> yeah but thank you thank you for for your well anyway you are the boss so <laughs> <laughs> i am <laughs> thank you guys uh thanks for your poem thank you for contribution and uh, uh good night everyone and thank you all thank you too thank you all bye. Bye. thank you bye bye bye, bye. 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 Uh, Catherine, you are staying. <laughs> Maybe you can.
Thank you so much, Sanajan. That was great. Thank you, Kasha. Thank you. Catherine, can you unmute your your mic? Yes, yes. Oh, I can. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Guys, it's the end of the party. <laughs> you can leave. Everyone has to go home, yeah. You, you can disconnect them. Maybe, maybe they, they don't know how to do that. I can remove them. Yeah, hold on a second. Thank you. <laughs> they may have left. They may have left and uh, yeah. they were here. It's quite difficult to work on, on the phone, especially yeah. it's, it's kind of different from the laptop. Yeah, I think so. So maybe people have left already and they're just here as ghosts. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, remove. Yeah, that was really good. What a great event. I think we had about um, probably about 40 people all together. Yeah, yeah. At the beginning, we had, I think, 50, then then they reduced. Cause... Yeah, 15, and then at some point we had 32, but then some people came in, some people left. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Probably. Some of them, I know that some of them don't know English, but they wanted to, uh, to be here to support okay. their friends, maybe. And because because I recognize some of them. Oh, wow, that's so yeah. cool. Yeah, but, uh, but they wanted to be here. That's why they, they left soon. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, that's probably what happened. Um, but it was better than, I, than, than what I was thinking. Yeah. Jennifer told me, oh, we only have 11 people signed up. And I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> they're such good poets. And I, I wanted them to have a good audience. And they did have a good audience. Yeah, but, but to be honest, it wasn't at all a good time because of the uh, all yeah. the economic yeah. problem and, the, uh, and the, the, the society is disappointed, actually. Yeah. Yeah, because of the death of this. Oh, yes, so sad. That, that yeah. was, that was so heartbreaking. I'm really glad. Oh. I'm really glad that Poet brought it up. And um, yeah, I should have mentioned that. Uh, I'm so, And I also thought, you know, we do sometimes do fundraisings, and maybe we could have put something up here for a migrant, you know, pro migrants or pro refugees because. Yeah, maybe we'll do something on the board. Maybe we maybe I'll send something to the whole board and just say maybe we could do a fundraise for the migrants yeah. because they're having a terrible time right now in the UK and yeah. it's yeah, it's really awful. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for backing up all the okay. scene. <laughs> My pleasure. And thank you for organizing it and no problem. You know, everything else you're going through and doing. Oh, you're recording. You're still recording. Oh my God, you've been talking. <laughs> okay, hold on. I'm going to stop. Yes.